Hello everyone, welcome back to Microsoft Flight Sim where I'm going to take a look at the GKS F111 which is available on sale from the marketplace for $25. I decided to purchase it because I'm going to try to fly to every country on the planet during the Olympics. This might be overly ambitious, but uh, it's, it's a goal. And I needed a fast plane. I don't want to take too long on this. And I've already gone around the world in the F-15, which I believe is the fastest real plane available for flight sim right now because there is no SR-71 or anything like that. So, or XB-70. Somebody's working on the XB-70, but we don't have the XB-70 yet. So, as far as I know, the F-15 is the fastest uh, real plane available. Of course, there are, there's a Dark Star, there's a Dark Star. But that leaves me with the F-14 from Heat Blur or uh, DC Designs also has an F-14 as well, and then this. So I decided to get this in an effort to see whether it would be a good choice because it has more range than the F-14. It's a heavier plane than the F-14. And the question is whether I'm going to be comfortable with it uh, on a very, very, very long flight. Uh, so it comes with a variety of liveries. I think I've added one livery. I think it's 15 altogether and they're split between the US Air Force and the Royal Australian Air Force. And those are the liveries you see here. I'm probably going to cook up a custom livery, sort of based on this one, but with an Olympic uh, vertical stabilizer. I think that would be best. I don't want to be too militant in going around the world. I don't want to seem very threatening. Let me put it that way. Now, I've, on weight and balance, uh, it just sort of constantly says uh, CG out of limit, uh, but when you try to fill it up here, you're not going to be actually able to get 100%. It's got to say 100%, but you can see it's beyond the max takeoff weight, but this isn't really the max takeoff weight down here. Uh, when it says 100,000 pounds, that's the maximum weight in flight. The maximum taxi and takeoff weight is actually 91,500. The reason why you have a higher in-flight maximum weight is because it can get eerily refueled. So it would basically carry up somewhat empty tanks and then get refueled up to the 100,000 pounds and then proceed. So right away, the interior is marvelous. Uh, you can see great detail on the instruments, decent weathering on the control sticks, reasonable weathering on the sides, and most, most of the things are flickable even though I have no idea what you would actually be doing with them. Hopefully, some of the stuff you shouldn't be doing stuff with. <laughs> you should not be deploying like, like some nuclear weapon or anything like that. But let's just go through some of the, the nuclear consent is right here, by the way. Uh, but let's go through some of the most essential things. First of all, you'll see that the yaw damper is, light is on and you will want to turn the yaw damper on. Uh, that will make sure that your plane does not wiggle all over the place. This is probably important. And ultimately the autopilot works pretty well, I've found, and we'll see that in flight. It's important to remember when flying this plane that its mass is the same as a DC, an initial DC-9, DC-9-15. It doesn't look it. It looks like a very slick plane, but, and it is, it can obviously go past Mach 2 up to Mach 2.5, but it doesn't handle like a fighter jet. It handles more like a bomber and, you know, a light bomber, but still you need to think about it in terms of being more of a DC-9 sort of plane than an F-14 even, even though the F-14 is quite heavy. And let's actually see the wing sweep in action on the ground first. So we have the wing sweep control here. It has some locks and that depends on what kind of loadout you have. So you can just keep it safe. And you just pull this back. So this is the first lock position, uh, 21.6 degrees. You can see it's slightly swept there. If I extend the flaps, oh actually it can sweep to this point with the flaps, uh, the leading slats down and the flaps slightly down. If I unlock this and sweep it further, and it sort of wobbles a little bit sometimes, and it does have wing flex, and then there's another lock back here. 
Now let's take a look at the fuel situation as I move this back to the forward position. And what we can do is get the inboard tanks and the forward aft and wing tanks and that will be just about right for the maximum takeoff weight. This loadout panel button here and here you can select which fuel tanks you want to place so if we can take those off and put them on that station then when we see outside they're on that station further out and there's a fixed pylon option out there but that's ugly and will cause extra drag the best one is the inner pylons for the external tanks and you can put tanks in the weapon bay as well now I got this off the marketplace so I can't get the weapon loadouts here you can see those are grayed out here so now that I've uh, got that let's see how we are here and so we're over the maximum takeoff weight here so we've got the bay tanks and we've got the inboard tanks and I like the inboard tanks because they keep it very streamlined let's see that with the wing sweep all the way back some of the textures do have more weathering than this one and more detail I think but what you can see is with the wings as far back as possible with these external tanks they just barely don't hit the fuselage <laughs> the external tanks they fit very snugly against the fuselage so I like that. I really don't want those pylons though. I regret suggesting that those pylons exist. Can we uh... okay well we can't change the loadout when it's retracted. And otherwise there's a setup panel here for ready to taxi state, cold and dark state. Okay we want to take away the pylons on the outside because and I might as well take away this pylon as well since I'm only going to have these tanks okay I'm gonna reset that master caution here's the anti-skid it says off oh it wants it on is the thing for takeoff it wanted it on okay so that's the anti-skid system right there okay so now we're set do pay attention to the warnings on that panel they are actually helpful <laughs> they're not trying to trick you okay let's take off and the important thing to note here is that the afterburner is on a separate button so right now we're not using the afterburner and I should probably not try to take off from the external view this is a very heavy aircraft and with its current load uh, 91,000 pounds let me just verify oh we're a little bit over oh right I have the ones in the base so I'm beyond the maximum takeoff weight in my testing with it already uh, I found that with the maximum takeoff weight, 1, uh, 91,500 pounds, it took off at about 160 knots. So here we are at 180. I'm pulling up. Okay, it really means it about the maximum takeoff weight. It really, it really doesn't want to take off. Ah! I got a kick somehow. Now, one thing I didn't do that I should have done was set takeoff trim. And you can press this button to set takeoff trim. And then it'll have a green light at the right time. I probably busted the landing gear somewhat. Landing gear retraction. Let me get the map. To a better position. Now Las Vegas seemed like a good place to talk about the handling characteristics since people do like to fly through the strip and everything. This is me pulling up while turning. Now we can... We've still got those forward little slats going. But I'm going to sweep it a little bit now to 26 degrees. So here I'm turning and pulling on the stick at the same time. 
and this is a turn rate. So it's not a sporty fighter by any stretch. You can see my ground speed on the Skyforce Sim thing, uh, 400 knots right now. Okay, nice and close to the tower. So the interior modeling is great. And actually when I buy a payware plane, the two things I'm looking for is a very complex interior cockpit and also, you know, failures, systems that fail and custom coding. So some of the custom coding you can see with the little panels, oh, a little hiccup there, uh, like the loadout panel and stuff like that. So I'm looking for custom coding like that, and also uh, the potential for engine failures. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So you can see it handles very well. And we will climb. And let's talk about the autopilot a little bit. Okay. So I'm going to set a height for the autopilot and I'm going to initially set to 30,000 feet or thereabouts. It's uh, weirdly precise. And then over here on the side I'm going to make sure to have it have pitch authority that sets it to the autopilot pitch autopilot roll. That just damps out the roll. It's not going to hold a heading. Uh, heading track is down here on this switch. Uh, and then altitude hold. So now it's going to climb at the rate that it thinks it can sustain. There, uh, I, don't, I haven't found any setting for how what the vertical speed ought to be. I think it just bases it on its current speed. So it'll climb faster if it is going faster. And it'll climb slower if, slower if it's going slower. Now we have these mountains in front of us. <laughs> so, that's not great. Let me, uh... Very nice terrain here. Okay, now that I've cleared the mountains. If it seems to be doing something wrong, you should just toggle it. Oftentimes when you change the altitude on here, it doesn't seem to want to go to the new altitude unless you flick the altitude hold switch off and on again. Other things to note, uh, there is a store jettison. It works. Uh, so if you want to dump the external tanks, they'll just disappear. Uh, so if you just want to get them to disappear, pressing that button will do it. I have not actually tried it, but the F-111 had a special fuel dump system where it would, if you have the auto, uh, afterburner on, ignite the fuel and that ignited fuel would create flames out the back. So that's a special feature. This is an efficient climb. I don't want to run the afterburner at low altitude. We could climb faster with the afterburner on, of course, but I don't want to run it at, at the low altitude. One of the interesting little features we have is the HUD reticle. Uh, we're not trying to shoot anything, so it, it's just the same thing for all of these. But but uh, it can make landing a little bit easier to give you a little reference point, maybe. It is a very slick looking plane. You'll notice the cabin pressure warning light. I've, I've looked around, I, I don't see any actual cabin pressure. I think you're just supposed to use your oxygen masks at that point. Uh, it'll also have a red cabin pressure light go up on here, on uh, that little display there right in front of us. Uh, I, I haven't noticed myself blacking out when that happens. As we've been going up, our uh, speed has been going down. We're approaching 200 knots here, which is a little bit iffy. and. 
and you can see that the vertical speed, the vertical rate has gone down compared to where it was before. It was above 2 before, or 2,000 feet per minute. So, what I'm going to do is light the afterburner. So, you should have an afterburner ignition act, uh, assigned. And I've got the button on, and you can see the effects starting out here. Now, as we accelerate, I'm going to deliberately leave the wings swept forward so you can see what happens there. So, that's the afterburner effect. A little bit more prominent at nighttime. And now you can see it's climbing faster, and of course, our indicated airspeed is faster. I actually want to break the sound barrier a little bit higher, so I'll go to 36,000 on here. There is an auto terrain following thing. I'm not too sure about that, and I'm not going to try it out just yet. For the purposes of the flight that I'm intending this for, I'm not going to be doing that and I would probably have more fun actually trying to fly the plane low level anyway so anything lower altitude I'm not gonna have the autopilot handle it. The HUD reticle does if I move left and right it moves like that. Okay you can see a little line there and that that line is indicating that our wings is swept too far forward for that speed so that's speed limit with the wings in their current position. And if we go beyond that, as we soon will because we've got the afterburner on, we get the reduced speed light. So I'm just going to sweep back. You can see at that level it's for Mach 1. And then for back it makes it better. Now of course as you sweep the wings back it reduces your lift. Also going past the sound barrier as we just did will cause us to plunge down because of transonic drag. So you can see we're losing altitude even though the autopilot is supposed to hold 36,000 feet which it was doing very nicely. Now the autopilot is compensating for the transonic drag and pulling us back up. But while it's ascending I might as well have it ascend further. We don't want to be using the fuel with afterburner on at this rate. You can see the fuel flow indicator. It's got everything you could possibly want. Uh, so the fuel flow indicator is right there. And we're like off the scale high right now. But it's, uh, well, as you go faster, the fuel will consume more. As you go higher, the fuel will consume less. So. There's a balance to be struck. There's all sorts of things. There's backup instruments here. True airspeed, for some reason measured in miles per hour instead of knots. Um, and then the fuel quantity down there. So if you want to figure out uh, whether you're going to make it to where you're going, the fuel quantity there, 40,000, that's the total. And then there's a gauge select here for the needle. The needle will point to the fuel quantity in that particular tank. And we don't have the outer or center external tanks, we have the inner ones. I'm not too sure about how the needle works. Because, I mean, I feel like if I sum it all up, it doesn't add up to 40,000 here. I think the needle is working on gallons instead of pounds, maybe? I'm not sure. So, uh, a little bit of a question about the needle, but hopefully the number is correct. But right now, if the number is correct, uh, since we're off-scale high, I'm assuming that's 16,000 per engine, so we don't have an hour's worth right now. That's 32,000 per hour. Oh, no. Uh, pounds per hour times 1,000. I'm not entirely sure about the needles. <laughs> uh, I'm not ent entirely sure about the needles. I've got an alternate option as far as gauging the fuel flow. Oh, for some reason the engines died. Oh, reduce speed again. Oh, it killed the afterburner is what it did. It shut off the afterburner to reduce speed. Interesting. So now I've swept them back all the way back. Yeah, I didn't push it that hard before. So anyway, I've got the sim outputting information to my stream deck. 
and right now it's telling me that each engine is consuming 2,500 gallons per hour and I'm holding nearly 6,000 gallons. That doesn't jive well with the pounds, but uh, I'll leave you to, I mean, the, I think the number on the fuel quantity gauge is correct. Uh, 6,000 gallons is about 39,000 pounds. What exactly is going on with the upper one? I think that's supposed to read 17,000 pounds per hour. And that's what that number is indicating. But the needle, when it says 80, that if you read it literally, it says 80 times 1,000 pounds per hour. So that'd be 80,000 pounds per hour. That is not what's happening. It's more like it's off the scale high for 8,000 pounds per hour. So. Uh, that should be the number 8, not the number 80, or that should be pounds per hour times 100. Um, sorry to be nitpicky, but these numbers are important when you're trying to fly around the world. <laughs> they really are, so, you know. Okay, we're going to 50,000 feet here, and we're at Mach 1.6. Wings fully swept back, the cabin pressure is, uh, well, you better have masks on. And it's looking like this right now. With the external tank snugly against the body. And pointing like an arrow. Again, as we speed up, since we're flattening out, we're not losing, we're not reducing our consumption. But we're speeding up, so we're increasing our consumption. And you can see that with the fuel flow indicator. And so I want to go higher, actually. Now, there is a special gauge over here, and you can see a seconds to go and total temp. Just because the plane could go to a certain speed, Mach 2.5, uh, doesn't mean it could sustain that speed. The internals of the engines have their limits, and they would get too hot over time. And so ultimately, we're going to have a little light come on down here again, and it will say total temp and that means that the temperature in the engine is accumulating too high and then the seconds to go will start ticking down <laughs> and uh, that, that's telling you that you have your limits. Now I haven't ever crossed the limit to see what would happen and you can see another bar there but that bar is for the engines so it's not for the wing sweep and it won't kill our afterburner immediately can see as it gets hotter that bar goes lower and then it drops like that and then the seconds to go starts ticking down and the total temp highlights over here so that's warning you that you've exceeded the total temp and so the thing to do is that we actually have multiple steps of afterburner it's good to have a throttle at this point so I've reduced the afterburner a little bit, and that reduces our fuel consumption. Every time I reduce the afterburner by a step, it'll reduce the fuel consumption. You can see the fuel consumption hit a new level there, and then a new level here, and then this is yet another level of afterburner. But now the needle is working, so now we know that's actually 7,000 pounds per hour for each engine, so 14,000. And we still have 37,000 pounds left. So that's pretty good. And hopefully that'll cool the engine down. And you can see the bar is back down to uh, velocity higher than what we're at, but we are slowing down. So you can go to Mach 2.5. Sustaining Mach 2.5 is the problem. Now, I, I don't want that long a flight. I'm looking for a two hour flight. Right now, if you take a look at 13,000, we could go for nearly three hours like this. And probably hold over Mach 2 like that. So it can go a fair distance, but I can go, it up, uh, go up a notch here. And actually it's still below the 8,000 pounds per hour there. So we still got two hours of fuel like that more than two hours worth of fuel and we're holding at Mach 2.2 and our temperature is safe so this is what I decided is a good cruise possibility and we could 
briefly take it up a little bit, especially as we get higher up. Right now I'm going to 65,000, we haven't climbed there yet. Once we level out, we'll have to see. I'll probably have to throttle down because once we level out, it'll be going faster, right? So let's wait until I level out and then see how the situation is. The one downside to flying in around the world flight at this speed is that you don't get to see details. But the F-111 does have the benefit of its swing wings, so it can get low and slow. It just isn't as maneuverable as, say, the F-14. And as far as low and slow goes, uh, sightseeing is better with the F-35. You can tell me what you think about the choice of plane as far as which one to use for the Olympic going to every country flight. Basically, I have from the start of the Olympics till the end of the Olympics to go through every country. I've got a flight path. It's actually a flight path that somebody posted to Reddit, and that's uh, what gave me the confidence to try to do this. However, it's still going to be an arduous flight. Even at these speeds, it's going to be a very difficult flight. And as long as we go fast, I can manage it, but that does limit the choice of planes. I decided not to go with Concorde because... Concord. I mean, even though it's, uh, well, it's peaceful, while it's peaceful, it really didn't give me the option to fly close to sites or anything like that. So the sightseeing option is low. But if you think Concord would be better, I'll take that into consideration. Okay, we are leveling out at 65,000. And we're at Mach 2.15. Well, I want to go a little bit faster, and our fuel flow has gone down now, so I'll pick it up there. Alright. Well, let me punch it and see how we do. So, now full afterburner at 65,000 feet. Still a very serene plane. A good match for the Valkyrie, really, the XB-70. Well, if we ever get to see them together, that'd be nice. Okay, past Mach 2.3. As you can see on the sky for sim dialog, it's uh, 1300 knots ground speed. But still, the F-15 has an easier time climbing, it has an easier time getting to Mach 2.5, um, which is why I've already flown it around the world. <laughs> so. But that was a normal circumnavigation, not trying to hit every country. For the every country flight, I don't know exactly what to call it, but I'll be streaming it on Twitch and then posting it on YouTube, I think. I thought about streaming on YouTube or alternating between the two, but I think this allows for the maximum accessibility to people. But I'll plan to post the entire streams instead of editing them down. Past Mach 2.4, but with less than two minutes on the seconds to go. And we'll find out what happens when we run out of time on that. Again, my guess is the afterburner cuts out. I perused the manual, but uh, it's a 77 page manual, so there are things that I missed. One thing I can tell you is uh, maximum rated speed. It says the maximum speed can be reached in certain conditions. Weight about 50,000 pounds. Altitude 50,000 feet or higher and wing position 50 degrees or greater. Currently our weight is 83,000 pounds, but we're way above 50,000 feet and our wing sweep is way beyond 50 degrees. So here we're uh, getting to 2.43, but we're running out of time here. So we should probably be lighter. And then maybe we would even be able to sustain Mach 2.5. But the Mach number limit... It, uh, see, the engines get hot because of the air passing through them at a certain speed. Uh, that's why the SR-71 has those shock cone intakes. The, this also has conical intakes to help manage that, but there's a limit. Okay, so let's see what happens. So we're not able to get Mach 2.5, but at a lighter weight we would. Well, we've run out of time. I 
However, uh, we haven't hit the upper bar on the total tim. You can see we're at about a little bit shy of 2000 degrees Celsius. So I don't know, maybe it won't kill us or maybe it will. Okay, I think we're just gonna have to role play the total temp. I don't know if it's actually going to stop me. Or maybe if we were really at Mach 2.5, it would. Okay, well, I actually want to land this plane. So now the landing mass is 80,000, that's the limit. We should reach that limit by the time we get to a good airport in Oregon. This can certainly get above 60, 65,000 feet, uh, but that's sort of a, a typical number to go with. It may be able to overperform in terms of altitude, probably can. I actually don't know why they left the yaw damper off initially when the pitch and roll dampers are on at the start. I feel like they're trying to trick people. <laughs> well, the time to go thing has not killed me yet, so I'll keep that in mind, but it might be dangerous. It might lull me into a false sense of security and ultimately get me when I'm least expecting. But cruising at 1400 knots right now. And that's with the throttle fully forward. Uh, fuel flow a little bit off scale, but it's basically 9,000 pounds per hour. We've got, uh, that's per engine, and then uh, 30,000 pounds altogether. So we've got more than one and a half hours at this speed still. And the F-111 was supposed to be able to go 3,500 nautical miles, so it seems like it's capable of doing that. With a more modest afterburner setting, I'm sure we could sustain that uh, within the normal velocity limit, say Mach 2.2. In that respect, it does have a benefit over the F-15. The F-15 doesn't have quite that much range normally. Well, at this point, uh, I am going to take it off of afterburner, and we're going to see how it does without that. So now, no afterburner on. You just need to throttle down to below 75%, it will disengage, and then you have to push the afterburner burner button again to engage it. And we'll see how it decelerates at this altitude without me going down. So I'm going to keep the altitude hold on. And see how it does. Some of the wobbliness is because we've got the roll damper on. I've not got the autopilot roll autopilot on right now. I've just got the damper, and so it just sort of settles into the damperness, I guess. But you can see, even without the afterburner on, it uh, it decelerates, but doesn't decelerate very quickly. And now we're in normal mode, and then it starts giving us extra seconds to go. It's cooling off. But probably for role-playing, we shouldn't push it like that. I wish there was some practical failure. The easy failure would be to just have it force the afterburner off or something. It does have an air brake. Uh, its air brake is actually the front of the landing gear <laughs> door. Um, it just extends that part. That's convenient. It does have an internal bay and those doors open. You can sort of see them right there. And right now we have fuel in that internal bay. We shouldn't have had. I took off with more fuel than I should have. And you saw what happened with that. But see, uh, we're still above Mach 1.9 and just very slowly decelerating because it is a very pointy arrow kind of thing with comparatively little drag. But okay, Portland is fast approaching and I need to descend. So I'm going to take off the altitude hold and switch to a pitch damper instead of pitch autopilot and I'm going to pitch down. 
but with the air brake, you can see there it is. A little bit choppy right there, but I think it's trying to load Portland. So, and you can see the wheels in there. It does have the normal silence up front and then the, the sound, the crack of the sound barrier there, the sonic boom. And so let's get a nice little view of it descending into Portland, shall we? The air brake light is there. It is nice and green. Very much stands out compared to some of the others. We're at 25,000 feet in descending. The Portland sort of special area sure doesn't blend well with the surrounding terrain much, does it? Well, we're now below the speed of sound. We can probably sweep this forward a bit. The air brake is not super effective. <laughs> right, we, we have the air brake out. The air brake's out. As far as where we're slowing down or not, I mean, we're descending a bit. Let me try and level out here. But you can see it's not like dramatically reducing our speed. This is still a very heavy plane, and it, it will like to land fast. If I was close to the end of my fuel, then that would be a different story, but right now we are at 78,000. We're just barely within landable territory as far as the manual is concerned. Okay, well... Now I should probably sweep the wings for fully forward now. On gear deployment, a little bit of flaps first. I mean, really, uh, you can see that the air brake position for the landing gear door is different from its normal position with the landing gear extended. The air brake position is further forward. Now, I haven't landed this many times. Uh, once, so far, I think. So, we will see how this goes. It's got a little tail bumper too. Oh, I'm coming in low. But uh, fairly good. About 160. It has a lot of momentum to it, and you've seen that in flight, and you know the fact that when we turn off the afterburner, it continues on at its speed for quite a bit. So now, one thing that I've had trouble with is I don't know if, what what exactly I'm doing wrong, but I, I don't have nose wheel steering right now. Um, so I, I do something wrong clearly. Uh, let me turn the anti-skid off and see if that's the issue. See, I've, I've got it off now. I still don't have nose wheel steering. So, what I end up doing, because I have no idea how to fix that, is uh, I go to the setup panel and click ready to taxi state and apply. It doesn't change anything else as far as I can tell, but now I can turn the nose wheel. <laughs> uh, it's a bit of a hack sort of way of going about it. I'm sure I'm doing something wrong, but it's it's all I've got right now. So that's my final tip for this one. So anyway, I'll just leave it on the taxiway for now, and there you have it. That is the F111 by GKS, and. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.